Bologna, sono tornato ah. a Bologna. Ah, mi quindi... Mi sono interessato sul piede, come vedi dalla foto. In ma posto. perché io volevo discutere di alcune cose scientifiche, ma magari quindi ci possiamo vedere a Bologna. Sì, anche se... Eh, sì, assolutamente. Mm. Ti, ti dico, io ho sto gesso che lo terrò parecchio, un altro... Ma io ti vengo anche a trovare volentieri, <ride> se hai voglia di Però, lavorare. Sì, magari... Eh, Vediamo. Eh, ti scrivo sì, e sì. ci mettiamo d'accordo. Sì, sì, perfetto. Perfetto. Spengo il microfono da qui un attimo. Sì. So the, uh, the first speaker is uh, Lorenzo Campos Venuti from uh, USC, who is uh, uh, online, unfortunately. I think he will tell us, uh, or at least the picture, I think it's very clear. <laughs> so um, I think, uh, uh, Lorenzo, I, you can start as you want. I start the recording. Okay, grazie Elisa, thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks to the organizer for, for the very kind invitation. It's a pity I cannot be there with you to enjoy this conference, but unfortunately, as you can see, I, I broke my, my, my leg. This is what happened when you, when you do these things on the left. Um, but it's nonetheless very nice to, be, to participate at least remotely. So I'm going to talk about uh, adiabatic theorems from, for open systems and the possible uh, way to use it uh, to, to gain some acceleration and speed up. And given the title of the conference seems to be a very fitting uh, title, uh, maybe even too fitting, and you may wonder that I'm going to tell you about things that you are already very much familiar with. Well, I. I I can't assure you that uh, you'll be falling asleep, but I'll do my best to keep you entertained. So um, without further ado, uh, this is the outline of my, my presentation. I'll just review the adiabatic theorem uh, for open and closed system. And I'll present uh, the idea of boundary cancellation and do some other generalization and then uh, report on implementing these new methods on, uh, on D-Wave uh, device. So let's start. And as promised, I'm going to start very simple with the uh, simplest and uh, probably also the most important uh, differential equation of quantum mechanics. So this is a, a first order differential equation with the, with the linear, right, with this operator L, it's a linear operator, I'm going to assume actually I'm always going to be in a finite dimensional space. So this is a bounded operator acting on some vector, which here I indicated row, which could be, for example, the density matrix of our system. And this uh, generator L depends on time and on some other time scale tau, which I indicated here. Uh, well, you know, you can find the solution of this, at least formally, of, the, of this differential equation. Um, the linearity allows us to, to write this, uh, the solution in, in a compact form. Uh, the interesting thing is that the solution is unique and it's uh, under very general conditions. For example, one simple condition is that in this integral converges. There are, the same is true in, under more general condition, but we won't need it. So that's a, you know, simple differential equation, but which nonetheless encompasses most, uh, most of the physics we deal with in quantum mechanics. Um, adiabatic expansion is, is about being interested in the solution of this differential equation when the, with this generator L varies slowly. Uh, what do you mean with that? I mean, uh, as it is, varying slowly, it's not a really precise uh, sentence. 
And in fact, here I'm quoting Arnold, he, he, he warned us that, that without further uh, assumption, the adiabatic uh, invariance is, is, is wrong. So just to make it more precise, I'm going to assume the following. So I'm going to assume that, the, that this generator L depends on this external time scale tau in this form. So this tau is basically the total annealing time. And with, of course, when tau is very large, uh, this implies that this generator L somehow, mm, it gives you an intuition that this, this generator L bar is slow. So you change the variable from time to this rescale time, and then you see that the, the, the tau parameter uh, becomes just a parameter of this differential equation and it comes out in this, in this form here. So now the problem is well defined, and we are so we want to find the solution of this differential equation. So what happened to the solution of this differential equation when tau goes to infinity? Or in other words, what happens when epsilon, which is tau to the minus one, goes to zero? Uh, mathematicians call this kind of uh, perturbation expansion a singular perturbation, because you see, if I set epsilon exactly equal to zero, uh, then the left-hand side here uh, is zero. So the, this is no longer a differential equation. Actually, this is going to tell us uh, something about the adiabatic limit. Uh, so it, these are a little bit complicated uh, perturbation uh, series to develop with. In this form, as I said, the setting is completely general. So this could, I, I could be talking about Schrodinger equation, for example, or I could be talking about, uh, you know, L could be a genuine Uvillian and Rho could be a genuine density matrix and your favorite uh, Lindblad master equation. So actually, which, which of these two settings should we, should we consider? Well, uh, actually, uh, because of the third law of thermodynamic, we can never achieve really zero temperature. So whenever we deal with physical systems, we should really be talking about open systems. So, uh, uh, for example, with an embedding description or something else. In this case, you know, the instantaneous steady state, which I indicate here with sigma, is uh, most likely, you know, the thermal state, like a Gibbs state, which I, 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 accept, I wrote here. And, uh, and the, the, the rule of the game now are about not preparing ground state, but about preparing um, Gibbs state, for example. We still can be hard classically, so this is still a, an important, uh, an important task. And of course, if, if the temperature is smaller than, than the gap of the Hamiltonian, the Gibbs state is close to the ground state, so we recover basically the, the, the zero temperature limit. Uh, in this setting, you can also ask a, a, a meaningful question. Let's say you, have a, you, you know that you have a speed up for the closed systems case, right? And then you can ask yourself, well, what happens when I, let's say, open the system, when I let my system interact with the bat, will the speed up survive? Well, this is a very complicated question also because when you deal with, when you talk about speed up, it means you have in mind a, a, a classical algorithm, right? And so you're comparing your quantum uh, algebraic preparation with, uh, with uh, some yet to be specified classical algorithm. And it's complicated because you know, face value, you don't really know if you're comparing Apple with Apple. Uh, nonetheless, we gave a, an argument in this, in this paper that the, uh, the, if there is a speed up at zero temperature, the speed up may survive when the temperature is of the order of the, of the Hamiltonian gap. And uh, the argument is in this paper. Uh, this is not necessarily a no-go theorem in the sense that, you know, actually in some cases, uh, being open, so interaction with the environment may even help. So you can actually achieve speed ups where, where there was no speed up before. So this is not necessarily the case. And in fact, I will give a few examples of this behavior in the following, namely uh, behavior where the open system case, so to speak, behave, behaves better than the, than the closed system case, which is a, a bit counterintuitive. So uh, good. So we want to generalize now the adiabatic theorem for, for open system. So in this case, so L will be our general Uvillian that describe our system uh, after we traced out the, the path, right? And 
I'm going to assume these are sometimes called ergodic or primitive Liouvillian. So basically, I'm going to assume that the steady state of this Liouvillian is unique and is this state sigma s. So these are instantaneous eigenstate of the Liouvillian. Okay. So basically, they're eigenvector with zero eigenvalue of this L at time s, at this rescale time. Instead, rho, rho s, I indicate with rho s, the, the state which is evolved under the dynamics starting from the steady state at time zero. So basically, we prepare, so ideally, we prepare our thermal state at time zero, then we turn on our adiabatic uh, algorithm, and we end up with, the, with rho s. But the state we want to prepare is sigma. Okay. So how does the adiabatic uh, theorem work? So we have to uh, generalize it to, to, to the, the standard adiabatic theorem that we learn in, in quantum mechanics courses to, to this setting. And quite surprisingly, when I was dealing with this problem, it was a few years ago, actually, 2016, but still adiabatic quantum computing was already very well developed, but there was no uh, generalization to open system at, at that time. So what do you do? You go to your office and I actually, I, I studied all the paper by, by Kato mainly and I, it was, I was able to generalize the, its um, proof to the open system case. And this is the, the result. So basically for some standard assumption here with standard assumption, I, I refer to some regularity assumption that assure you that the differential equation is a, as a unique solution, these are super general. Then there is a little bit more of a technical assumption. This, so I'm assuming that this L generator generates a contraction semigroup. Mainly, the norm of this object here is uh, smaller than one. So this is more general than unitaries, and actually even more general than you really that generates completely positive map. And on the on the same time, it's easier to check. So this. Basically, it's uh, technical, but it's a physical assumption that assures that our Liouvillian produces physical uh, states. And then comes another physical, very physical assumption, namely, if the Liouvillian has a gap, now the gap is a complex parameter, no longer uh, since uh, L is not emission. Um, but nonetheless, we require that there is a gap above the zero eigenvalue for all S in zero one. And then you can prove the following, namely, the distance between the exact state you end up with, so this row one at the end of the evolution, uh, to the state that you want to prepare, this instantaneous steady state at, uh, at, at the end of the evolution. So this distance is bounded by some constant uh, divided by this uh, anneal, total anneal time. So if you make the total anneal time large, then this you converge to the instantaneous steady state. And actually, you can work out also explicitly what this constant and uh, you can derive uh, many interesting things. As I said, this, this setting is more general than the than, than CP maps. So it includes also, for example, red field master equation, for example, which are do not generate uh, necessarily uh, positive states, but are nonetheless useful in some situation and include as a special case, of course, the unitary case. So, okay, good. Uh, so that's the standard, let's say, adiabatic theorem in its most standard form. Um, can we do better? So namely, the, the question arises, can we make this error smaller, right? And instead of uh, decreasing like one over tau, can we make this error smaller? So it was actually known for a long time uh, that in the, in the closed so unitary or Hamiltonian case, uh, if you have, a, if you engineer the schedule in a particular way, uh, you're able to make this what I call this adiabatic error. So this distance between the exact state and the state you want to prepare. Well, you can make this adiabatic distance uh, decrease as the inverse power of this of this tau parameter of this annealing parameter uh, to the power k plus one. And k is the number of vanishing derivative of the Hamiltonian at the beginning and at the end. It's a bit of a well, uh, I don't know if you have, a, well, there are ways to give a, uh, an intuitive picture of this requirement. Anyway, basically you require that the Hamiltonian starts or the schedule starts in a flat way, right? And end up also in a flat way. So at the beginning 
all the derivatives up to some power k are zero, and at the end, all to, all to the derivative to some power k are zero. Of course, if this is the case, you can make the error smaller, right? And so this would be highly beneficial. So can we generalize this to the open system setting? Well, again, you go back to your office and, and try to generalize, and the answer is yes, indeed you can. Uh, and here, actually, there is an interesting uh, difference, one of these differences that was mentioned before between the closed and the open system. So here, actually, to obtain the same result, so this improved accelerated uh, scaling with tau, with the annealing parameter, you only need that the Liouvillian has vanishing derivative at the end. And I mean, the reason for this are, there are several reasons, most of which are technical, but ultimately, basically, the reason is that the, the Liouvillian uh, it generates an error of time because of its uh, non, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and so, and so this is what, what makes, uh, you know, zero and one different. Of course, in, in the unitary case, we could have started from, from the end and end up at zero, and this would be a, a valid dynamical evolution. This is no longer a case here because the inverse of our generator wouldn't be a, we wouldn't generate a, a quantum state, you know, wouldn't be generate the CP maps. So there is this, that's nice. Okay, good. So this, maybe we can use this for, you know, to, to, to achieve better convergence. And uh, so you can ask, okay, this is true, you know, in, in general, but can I ever achieve this? So can I engineer a situation where I do have this, this, uh, this vanishing derivative at the end of the Liouvillian? So, because when you deal with the Liouvillian, the Liouvillian has, uh, and here I'm, for example, I'm mentioning, uh, a realistic Liouvillian, for example, uh, this this is a very common uh, Liouvillian uh, uh, derived in by Tamin Albash and others in some time ago. And it's also called adiabatic master equation. Essentially, it's uh, well, it's it's a Liouvillian in, in time dependent time dependent Davis form. Okay, where this A operator here. Um, are the system bath operators, so they, uh, they, they, they keep memory of the of the bath and the gamma also as the bath correlation function essentially. So there is some information about the bath which is hidden in this uh, well, not in, in this a operator here. So the question is, can we you know engineer such a Limbladian to have vanishing derivative at the end? Of course, we without controlling the bath, right? Because this is by definition something we cannot control. And the answer is yes. Uh, so uh, hopefully, uh, so it's good. Essentially, it, it suffices to, if you engineer the system Hamiltonian, which is this Hamiltonian here, H of S, to a vanishing derivative at the end, this will imply that the Limbladian, the overall Limbladian is vanishing derivative at the end. And so as a consequence, we will have this accelerated uh, Convergence to the to the steady state to the state we want to prepare. Um, so that's good. So then you can also ask if this result is is solid somehow because here I, you know, I derive it for a particular uh, Liouvillian of this of this special form. And if you are familiar with master equation, you know that there are gazillions of different master equation. Basically, every Everybody has his own preferred master equation. Um, so is the result somehow solid and doesn't, uh, oh, here, of course, this tells us that, you know, this allows us to, to, to have the same accuracy with a smaller uh, annealing time. And as I said, uh, the question is, is, is the result solid? Here I'm, I'm, I'm um, recalling the, just schematically the approximation uh, the, which are employed to derive the Limblad master equation. So system, small system bath coupling, you assume that the full density matrix factorizes, then you have the board mark of approximation. And after this step, basically you uh, end up with the so-called Redfield master equation. And you can also do this in the, in the time dependent setting and you, derive a sort of uh, adiabatic Redfield master equation. 
And then if you apply a rotating wave approximation, you get the Limbla master equation, which is what I just showed before. And uh, so the Redfield the numerics on the, on the Redfield master, the Badic Redfield master equation show that actually the previous results, so this accelerated uh, scaling with, of the adiabatic error still works also for the red field. So that's good. And uh, then of course, I mean, the result always holds in a more general setting. If we assume, you know, uh, unitary um, uh, Hamiltonian um, evolution for the system plus the bat and where the bat is unknown and then we trace out but in this case we must assume that the uh, that the system Hamiltonian has vanishing derivative also at the beginning as I was showing before uh, and by the way one of the just let me mention uh, in passing that one of the uh, benefit of using master equation is that First, we can discard the bath to a, to a large extent. And also, implicitly, we are assuming that the, that the bath is infinite, which is something that we actually we use uh, many times, because if the bath is finite, then you have Poincaré recurrences and all sorts of uh, uh, somehow pathological behavior. So it's, it's good, at least mathematically, conceptually, to have the, the bath sent to infinity. But that's uh, somehow another an aside uh, remark. So that's a theorem. So you should be, so you should trust it. But if you don't, uh, you know, here are some numerics. So here, as I said, is the is this uh, schedule, which is engineered to be linear at the end, or quadratic, or cubic, or and so on. So in such a way that uh, it has k vanishing derivative only at the end. And uh, well, these are simulation for the single, single qubit, but I also have simulation for, for several qubits, which are not shown here. And indeed, as you can see, uh, the results matches very well the theory. Uh, well, namely because, I mean, you can also ask the theorem in, in itself is a bound, right? But here, we, this, this plot actually showed that the, the bound is basically captured the correct scaling for large uh, annealed time. And it also tells you that it is a sensible way to decrease the, the adiabatic error because you know, if you set yourself at a certain total time, this, this uh, you know, change in this schedule can allow you to, to move several order of magnitudes, uh, to have several order of magnitudes smaller adiabatic error. So, uh, that's nice. Uh, then you may want to, you, you wonder, okay, if this is, seems uh, interesting, can we implement it on, uh, for example, on a D-Wave device? And uh, before going to the, to the actual experiment, I'm gonna recall uh, a little bit of, of theory. So uh, as you all know, probably, uh, so the D-Wave machine prepares this, uh, this system Hamiltonian, time dependent, which is made up of this um, transverse field, Hx, multiplied by the schedule function usually called A. And A starts large and, uh, and, and, and goes to zero as, as, the, as time goes by. And then you, you have the longitudinal term, Hz, which includes the, the whose ground state is is the solution of, and cause the solution of our computational problem multiplied by this schedule function B. And whereas B starts from zero and then progressively increases as time increases. So this is what, what, uh, what the wave machine does essentially. And um, um, now uh, let's say we model we try to get some insight uh, to how the machine works, and we model the the, the D wave with the adiabatic master equation that I showed before. And if you talk to experimentalists long enough, well, you you realize that uh, the system bath coupling is uh, predominantly uh, longitudinal, so meaning this A operator that I wrote before are basically Pauli sigma Z. Okay. 
And then we immediately face, face a problem because uh, at the end of the evolution, when the A parameter is zero, the system bath coupling commutes with the Hamiltonian because at the end of the evolution, the Hamiltonian is just uh, along uh, Z, right? So the bath operate, the system bath operator commute with the Hamiltonian at the end. And actually you can show that this implies that the, at the end of the evolution, the zero eigenvalue, so the steady state manifold is at least D for the degenerate, where D is the dimension of the Hilbert space. So it's a huge degeneracy. So presumably before that point, the Liouvillian is ergodic, so there's a unique steady state. So which means that the, the gap closes at the end, the Liouvillian gap. So uh, this is actually bad news because we cannot use the, you know, the adiabatic theorem that I showed before. Um, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm seeing now a question. Yes, there is a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to keep it for the end or, or uh, answer maybe I now. Can take a look. Two questions. Yes, yes, yes. So, the, so maybe I should uh, read the question. I have two questions. Could uh, an analogous relation on the trace norm between the state and the instantaneous thermal state be derived at any s? Yes, of course, there's nothing special about, about one. Here I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm showing the, this algebraic error for, for the last, uh, for, the, for the s equal one point, but you can derive, of course, you can put yourself at any s if you would like. And the second question is, is the Markovianity assumption strictly required? Um, it's a good question. Not entirely, in the sense that, as I showed, uh, some uh, well, some degree of Markovianity. It's uh, maybe. I mean, it, it, we have to agree what you mean with Markovianity somehow. But uh, as I mentioned before, um, the, so these results are valid for for Redfield master equation, which are not less Markovian than the than the than the <laughs> yeah, sure. No memory, Markovianity, you mean no memory effect. Yeah. Um, let's say they work and uh, when the, the generator is time local in, in this way. So if you have full memory effect, then the generator is, uh, I take it back actually, because uh, the Markovian, the, the, sorry, the Redfield master equation has memory effect. So then yes, the answer is yes. So, okay. So as I said, um, here you see that the, the form of the, of the noise of the system bath coupling somehow seems to be a bad news because you know, we cannot use the, because the Lewinian gap closes and so we cannot use the standard. Uh, uh, theorem. So what do you do? Oh, sorry, I think you, I muted. Did you hear me? I... We hear you nicely, but... Uh... Okay, okay, I, I, I disappeared for a second. Okay, so as I said, you cannot use the, um, the standard adiabatic theorem because the gap closes. So what you do, you, you go back to your office again and try to generalize the, the, the results to the case where the gap closes. And first, I consider the case where the gap closes at the end, at the end of the evolution, and you assume you also enforce this boundary cancellation procedure. So namely, you make the schedule flat such that in such a way that the Uvillian has vanishing derivative at the end. So the gap closes at the end, and at the same point, you, uh, you enforce boundary cancellation there. And then you, you find out that the, uh, the adiabatic error is now bounded by some constant over tau to some power eta, and now this power eta has this special form, where alpha is the is the is the exponent uh, that dictates the way the way the gap closes at the, at s equal one. Okay, and you can note that this uh, this eta as a function of k is always larger than one over alpha plus one, which is the, the case with boundary, without boundary cancellation when k is zero. 
And then, you know, if you make the, the schedule infinitely flat, so you have infinitely many derivatives, uh, which are zero, the most you can get is this eta becomes one over alpha. So you see, this is uh, somehow bad news. So not entirely uh, unexpected, but it tells you that the um, boundary cancellation in this case is not, is, is only mildly effective. It's not really powerful. And uh, to be complete, actually, you would like to see what happens if the gap closes in the middle. And here, uh, well, somehow I've been stuck on this problem for, for, for a long time. And unfortunately, I couldn't prove in full generality. But I have extensive numerics that shows that actually, so now I assume the same thing. Just, you know, I have standard assumption and, and so on. And now the Liouvillean gap closes in the middle. But we perform boundary cancellation at the end. In this case, the adiabatic error uh, scales with the inverse power of tau to the k plus one. So this is the same as uh, there was no um, uh, gap closing at all. Same for the gap case. This is actually very uh, quite surprising because for the for the closed system case, uh, the result is actually that you, you, uh, that the adiabatic error scales with the exponent, which is fraction, which is more than one. In this, and it is this one over alpha plus one, basically. And the, all the benefits of boundary cancellation are gone. But somehow, for some, as I said, for some strange reason. Um, in the in the open system case, you you get this uh, this benefit, and uh, here I have this one one of the numerics that showed this very well that this this is the case, and uh, as I said, this is one of these examples where the open system case, so to speak, behaves better than the unitary case. Um, I can almost prove it, but not in the, in the full generality, which is I always must assume something more. So this is a little bit of a work in progress. But anyway, actually, for D-Wave, we can never set ourselves in, in this setting. So this is just for, for completeness now. So um, there is another um, phenomenon. If you if you are familiar with the way you're uh, you probably heard of it. And it's the fact that actually it's, it's called so-called freezing. And it's, fact, it's the fact that the dynamic essentially stops at uh, freezing time, which is before the end of the annual. And that before, even before the, uh, the, the time where the, this A parameter goes to zero. And uh, I can give an explanation of this um, of this phenomenon based on this uh, adiabatic master equation, um, which I which I wrote before. Um, this, uh, if if you set yourself uh, in the uh, energy eigenbasis, namely this n and m labels are instantaneous eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Okay, then it is known that the diagonal element of the density matrix evolved with the Pauli master equation, which is now time dependent, okay? Where this W rates, W have this form here for, for, for D wave, okay? With the same assumption. And now, um, because of, again, because of the fact that the, um, the system buffer operator uh, sigma Z and they commute with the Hamiltonian at the end, you can show that the weights vanish at the end of the annual. And in fact, vanish with a large power. So the, these weights, which are the transition rate, so I'll tell you uh, how do you deplete level zero and, and you go to level N or vice versa, you jump from level N to level zero. Well, this transition rate uh, vanish with the large power of A so A to two to the Q, where Q is the Hamming distance between the ground state zero and the excited state N. So essentially you see um, these terms here are all very small, even before uh, A is zero, because as I said, this vanish with the, with the power. In fact, we can, uh, 
you can basically define this freezing time to be the the time where this uh, where this uh, rates are basically in inverse of the you know typical time scale of the system which we can set to be the, the total annual time and this uh, also gives good results in this, this definition with our uh, uh, numerical findings. The, in, in the paper that I'm gonna cite later on, the explanation is a bit more uh, complete, but basically this is the gist of the, of the idea. So now, um, good. So now let's, let's, we have all the ingredients, so to speak of the theory. Uh, so we uh, now we want to try to implement this boundary cancellation on, on DWIF. So for we have to avoid freezing because after after freezing the dynamic doesn't change. So it doesn't matter if you perform if you do boundary cancellation after freezing because the system wouldn't see it. This is even true for for you know for pneumatics. Yeah. So basically, you have to set yourself uh, before at at the time where a is non-zero and it's before freezing and then we engineer the schedule a and b in order to have approximately vanishing derivative at the end up to order k and this is achieved to some extent by the some of the latest generation of d-wave devices the d-wave 2000 which allows you to specify a and b to be uh, piecewise continuous with the straight lines so uh, and you have uh, 11 points to engineer A and B. So if you have some limit, very limited uh, uh, engineering capability, but nonetheless, you have some uh, capability. And so basically we engineer the schedule with uh, the capability that we have in order to be flattish somehow at this point uh, where the A parameter is not zero. And finally, we ramped to the final values of the uh, which are required by D-Wave, uh, after which we do measurement in the computational basis. So um, this is, for example, a physical schedule in, that we use. So this is a schedule that you see we stop at the value of A. This is the A uh, schedule that doesn't go to zero. We stop here, essentially. And this is for a value that approximately is quadratic. But of course, since this is, uh, you know, these are piecewise constant, it's not, you know, the theorem is not satisfied exactly, but nonetheless, there is a result, uh, which I haven't mentioned before, according to which if you try to enforce boundary cancellation, but you only achieve it um, approximately, you at least, you know, if, if your system is what you expect it to be, then the, adiabatic error is still uh, decreases. Although the scaling maybe is not the one that you expect, but the adiabatic error is smaller. So there is theory that tells you that it's, uh, it's nonetheless good. So uh, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, I mean, it's part of the beauty of, of physics that, uh, you know, the horse is not really a sphere. So our, uh, the DOE machine doesn't, Below uh, behave exactly as as you would like it to be. So, namely, there are several Hamiltonian programming error, also called integrated control errors. Namely, the Hamiltonian you are trying to you end up not with the Hamiltonian that you are trying to program, and there are some uh, noise uh, on this. Then there are discretization error in the annealing schedule. Um, there is a further uh, um, phenomenon of anomalous heating, which is namely the fact that the temperature is actually not constant during the whole annealing procedure. Then there are Markov approximation in the deriving the blade and the form of the noise, which is unknown, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, in particular, so, and all of this, basically, most of this error we have no control over. And we have, we don't really know the extent to which they play and, and so on. Uh, the only thing we know is actually this discretization error in the annealing schedule. So the fact that we approximate, you know, a quadratic function with this uh, piecewise linear uh, function with only 11 points. Actually, this 
uh, numerically, we check numerically that this give rise to large errors. And here we show results. I don't know if you can see it, but basically um, here are the exponent that you obtain uh, with this so-called, uh, these are numerical results, but obtained with the uh, D-wave uh, piecewise linear uh, B, uh, beta schedule, which is the implementing the boundary cancellation, but with only 11 points. And then you get this exponent 0, 0,7, 1.49, And if you use many more points, so this high precision, then you go from 1.5, let's say to 1.6, and from 1.7 to 2.6 or 2.7. So you see you, actually this, um, this characterization error uh, it's, this shows that this discretization error are large. And finally, I can present the results. So in the paper, there's much more, but I don't have time to present. Um, so here, basically, you see the, the ground state probability uh, for different um, schedules. So schedule approximating the linear case so basically they end up in, in a linear fashion or uh, so with k equal zero or with k equal one or k equal two okay and the result are you know they're here the gap at least from the theory you uh, in, in principle this uh, you read it now is it's, it's gapped so you would expect the exponent eta to be one plus k and instead you, you get here considerably smaller numbers. Um, um, so uh, by the way, the, the top panels are uh, just native standard. Uh, this, is, this is a problem of eight qubit, a ferromagnetic chain essentially with different couplings. And they differ from where we employ the boundary cancellation. So basically the, the freezing is at a point where S is more or less 0 0.5. And we do see that if we approach the freezing time, uh, boundary cancellation doesn't change. So here you see that these curves are, are basically all the same. So it, it doesn't really matter if you employ boundary cancellation because the system is already frozen. If you move a little bit from the, from the freezing time, so you go a bit, you stop and a bit before that, uh, then you start to see that boundary cancellation become effective. And here you see that the best results are obtained for uh, when S is roughly 0 0.45. And the lower panel are the same result, but now with quantum adiabatic correction, namely we, have, we substitute basically each, each uh, qubit with three uh, logical qubit. And you see that in this case, you also see a, a good improvement on the exponent. And now the exponents are roughly half of the expected value. But I would say, given all the sources of error that are there, including, as I said, the discretization error, which is played a big role. After all, these results are not so, are not so bad. And uh, in the hindsight, face value, actually, they they show you, since they are not consistent with the gapless form of this exponent that I showed before, basically these are a proof that our Mervillian is gapped. And I think I can stop here. Uh, here, my conclusion, I show that basically I we generalize the adiabatic theorem to open system. And in some cases, actually, it's better behaved than the in the closed system version of the adiabatic uh, case and uh, boundary cancellation on D-wave, it's, uh, it's somehow effective in the sense that uh, it can increase the ground state population. And uh, if you also uh, use it in conjunction with the quantum annealing correction, then it makes results which are better than each uh, alone. So thank you for your attention and uh, if you want, if you have any question, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. So I think we can start from questions from here or, okay, Paolo.
Hi, Lorenzo. Thanks for the Hi. talk. Thanks for the talk. So it was, it was nice. It was nice to hear all these old results and the new as well. So I've got a question for you. Uh, for your in your theorem, you have this constant c. That uh, uh, well, there's no k dependence there in the notation, but I believe there must be one because at least dimensionally, uh, well, if you have higher power of the time, uh, well. The, the constant should uh, change dimensions accordingly, right? So my question is: Is do do we have do you guys have a, a general expression for the pref for the constant c as a function of the system gap of the Liouvillian gap? Is it like something like one over delta to the k power? So in other terms, how does this prefactor changes with the system size? And by the way, Lawrence, uh, what is Delta is, of course, in general, as you mentioned, is a complex number, but of course here is a real one. Are you guys taking taking the real part or the modulus of the gap? Okay, these are my questions. Thank you. Yeah, very good question, actually. So yes, the so the C, yes, of course, this constant does depend on, on, on K, of course, also because of dimensional argument. And um, so the short answer is, uh, in, principle you may obtain it it would require <laughs> really a lot of work uh, yeah it's uh, yeah as i said it's not it's, and the work would be you know for each different k you would do you we would have to do a lot of work i don't know if if you want to go through that pain <laughs> and by the way you know even for k equals zero the the, the value of this constant is there's a lot of interest in, in this in this constant actually because it sets the adiabatic time scale in, in fact. And uh, as of now, most of the times the adiabatic theorem well underestimates somehow or, or sort of overestimates the adiabatic scale usually that you get from the theorem. Uh, so I don't know, but the 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 important the nice the nice fact is that, for example, as given by this plot here, that you can see this constant k, this, this constant, sorry, c of k, which probably grows with k, doesn't grow too much in the sense that you do see sensible, you know, you do see that the fact that the, uh, that the adiabatic error diminishes. And uh, finally, the, the gap, uh, no, the gap is, is complex. What I wrote before was, uh, was a was meant to be a complex number actually. It's just the, the dependent on s is. Uh, I mean, it, it depends on a real parameter, but then there are also other parameters which are now complex. So, the uh, the and now you require well. I mean, if the gap closes, it means that both the imaginary and the and the real part vanish. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Another question from here. And you show that uh, when the system bus bus coupling is uh, the bus couples to the sigma z, um, the the system Hamiltonian and the interaction commutes, and uh, in that case uh, the Liouvillean gap closes at s equal one. And, uh, but uh, you showed that the uh, adiabatic theorem holds when uh, the Liouvillean gap is scaled as one minus s to the power alpha. So uh, can I, can we yeah. estimate the exponent alpha from the function of Annealing schedule, annealing schedule uh, function. Yeah, good question. So uh, actually, here in this case, uh, alpha is the exponent uh, which determines the speed at which the gap closes without boundary cancellation. Because when you employ boundary cancellation, basically you are rescaling the, this, this s, right? So then it, it will depend on k. So this is the, the way the gap closes without boundary cancellation, where k is zero, if you want. And coming to this exponent alpha, uh, there are some interesting facts. So 
in the um, in the in the unitary case, basically most most level crossing would be just exactly level crossing. So where this alpha would be one essentially. So that would be a you know an X, right? Two levels that cross uh, linearly. But in the in the, um, so as I said, in the unitary closed system case, the most common value for alpha would be one. For um, Liouvillians, now alpha cannot be one because you cannot go lower than, than the zero eigenvalue. So alpha is, and there are some theorem that if the dependence uh, of the, the schedule is analytic, which is basically what we are, well, sufficiently smooth, let's say, uh, well, alpha should be an integer. So the most common uh, guess, I would say, is that alpha is two. And in fact, this is the value that you observe for the single qubit uh, adiabatic master equation, where you see that alpha is two. Um, that's all I, so without further uh, <laughs> studying or assumption, uh, this is the, the value I would Im imagine. Uh, Basically, you, you would need something else, you know, use some, some sort of symmetry, some, some other argument why alpha should be larger. But two, I would say, is the most uh, probable value. Yes. Okay, there is a time for another question here. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, how do you define the adiabatic error when you have degenerate ground states at the end of an ending process? Uh, yeah, so basically, that's a good point. You're saying, what is sigma one, right? right? Very good question. So in fact, uh, this is actually another, um, this allow me to, to point out another other fact where the open system case behave better than the closed system one, because basically in that case you should consider you should uh, consider this sigma one actually as the limit of sigma s when s goes to one from the left, right? And that would be actually the you know assume that sigma is your thermal state at, at uh, any s smaller than one. This would mean that sigma one is the thermal state. At the uh, also at the limit. Uh, so basically, this um, this behavior is not. I mean, it, we, in the open system setting, actually, when you have a level crossing, sorry, in the closed system setting, if you have a level crossing, so if your ground state, uh, you have a level crossing with the ground state, the adiabatic theorem still works. But then you don't end up in the ground state anymore. You end up in an excited state. The the closed system, the sorry, the open the adiabatic theorem for open system is set. Uh, guarantees that you always stay in the, in the, so to speak, in the ground state or in the in the in the, in the steady state. And the uh, second question is, uh, you showed that uh, if the gap closes in between in the middle of the annealing process, then your results are basically the same uh, that you have for gap system, right? So I was wondering how much of this is related to the fact that in open systems. Uh, you know, the, the dynamics intrinsically tries to take the system towards the zero eigenvalue. So after the gap closes in the middle and then you let it evolve for the rest of the ending time, what the effect of the gap closing in between is basically smeared out because the dynamics itself is trying to take the system to the ground state. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can make up uh, a, a lot of you know, intuitive um, explanation and I think yours is, is, is a good one. Uh, when you have to actually have to prove this theorem, you have a series and actually it looks a bit of a magic because this, there are terms in the series which diverge because the gap closes. So, so there are some terms that diverge and this which should cause trouble, but so for some reason they don't cause trouble. So that's the, the, uh, you know, the, the technical reason why. So you have to find a, a smart way to, to, to deal with those terms, yeah. Okay, I think, uh, thank you Lorenzo again for the very nice talk. Thanks Lorenzo again. 
and uh, 